Welcome to the Buy Box Experts Podcast. We bring to light the unique opportunities brands face in today's e-commerce world. Hi, I'm James Thompson, one of the hosts of the Buy Box Experts Podcast. I'm a partner with Buy Box Experts and the former business head of the Selling on Amazon team at Amazon, as well as the first account manager for the Fulfillment by Amazon program. I'm the co-author of a couple of books on Amazon, including the recent book, Controlling Your Brand in the Age of Amazon. Today's episode is brought to you by Buybox Experts. Buybox Experts takes ambitious brands and makes them unbeatable. When you hire Buybox Experts, you receive the strategy optimization and marketing performance to succeed on Amazon. Go to buyboxexperts.com to learn more. Before I introduce our guests today, I want to send a big shout out to the team at Disruptive Advertising. For off Amazon advertising, Disruptive Advertising offers the highest level of service in the digital marketing industry. Focusing on driving traffic, converting traffic, and enterprise analytics, Disruptive helps their clients increase their bottom line month after month. Check out disruptiveadvertising.com to learn more. Today, we have a very unusual podcast for you. We are joined today by three very large private label sellers, all of whom import products directly from Asia. All three are seeing firsthand the challenges of the shipping delays that are currently in place with a major shortage on raw materials and shipping containers, slowing down everyone's ability to get their products out of Asia. Before we go too far into these issues, let me introduce each of our three guests. Sanjay Chandaram is CEO and co-founder of Caliber Global, a premier brand collective and top 50 private label Amazon seller. Chuck Kragorich is co-founder of Net Health Shops LLC and Net Pet Shops LLC, a multi-channel home decor and pet product e-commerce company that imports from several countries and sells on over 20 marketplaces in the US, Canada, and Mexico. We're also joined by Jerry Kavesh, CEO of Western Outlets, an Amazon seller of both branded and private label apparel and footwear. Sanjay, Chuck, and Jerry, welcome and thank you all for joining me today on the Buybox Experts podcast. Gentlemen, let me start by asking you, um, I've brought you together today because companies of all sizes are experiencing significant shipping delays and higher costs to get their finished products out of Asia. Please give me some details on what the problems look like today, when they got started, and what you believe some of the root causes are of these challenges. James, I, I, I think this, you know, this whole thing started um, last May and June when we started doing these blank sailings. Um, the demand was down, and so um, as we were trying to get stuff out of Asia, things were getting pushed from one week to another. And then when all the volume started coming back in the third mm-hmm. and fourth quarter, mm-hmm. um, it just, we just couldn't find room on those freight liners. And then we started paying a little bit extra. And then of course, here after Christmas, it just, it just blew up. Um, the cost for containers, I know we were paying, you know, 5,000 extra for some containers wow. above and beyond what we normally would, not all of them. Um, and we probably in January only got about half of our containers out of Asia that we wanted. Um, mm-hmm. Luckily for us, um, we somehow guessed back in July this was going to happen. And so we started shipping stuff back in October that would normally ship in January. So we're not beat up as bad as we could have been. But, um, but yeah, your carrying costs are a little bit higher because you've got extra inventory sitting here now. Yes. Okay. Sanjay, what, what are you, I'm sorry, Jerry. Yeah, what, what are you I was going to say, we had a very similar experience. We've had a very similar experience. Um, our factories also started highlighting to us. They were having issues getting containers um, out. And so they recommended that we put in our orders earlier. And we did, which meant that we were, um, we were in a better position going into fourth quarter um, than some of our competition. And being worried somewhat unique in that we sell both branded and, un- and private label products. So we were able to see both sides of the equation, those brands that had anticipated and brought in product early. Um, we're, they were in business and they, they saw a very strong fourth quarter. Um, those who did not were out of, were out of product and, that, and not being able to get product into the country has, has really um, cascaded into the first quarter and, and cascading further into second quarter. And so... Um, we are actually in the situation where we're seeing, um, even though we had additional product in stock, we have out, sold out of many of that product just because, like um, Chuck said, we had it. And mm-hmm. now we're in the position of trying to get um, containers into the country, which has been very challenging. So. 
Sanjay, what, what are you seeing with your business today? Very similar, James. So we noticed this early in the second quarter last year, and this was coming out, out of Chinese New Year when factories in China were closed. So we were well positioned in that we had a lot of inventory. Uh, so that put us in a position of advantage in April, May, when uh, the competition ran out. And uh, what we did was, given our business is pretty heavy Q4-centric, mm -hmm. we analyzed our Q4 orders by middle to end of June, at least a month earlier than we normally do. And the idea was to have products start shipping early to mid-August and receive everything by end September. Unfortunately, that didn't quite work out the way we expected due to uh, delays and uh, not, not, non-availability of uh, containers. So during that time, the shipping costs tripled from what they were in the first quarter. Wow. Uh, and of course, there were issues down the line when it came to uh, getting containers released at the ports and then receiving at Amazon and their restrictions. So it had a cascading effect, but uh, you know, overall, it's been a challenging time. So, so let me let me confirm I understand this problem so just the right way, Sanjay. When you talk about you're having problems finding containers, my understanding is there's enough boats, but there's physically not enough of these shipping containers available. Right. Am I understanding this problem correctly? And, and if so, where do these containers go that they're no longer available? I'm not sure about the details of where these containers went. I just think that there is uh, more demand for products and production has gone up and there's more products being shipped. So there is a finite amount of uh, uh, shipping freight, uh, sorry, freight liners as well as uh, containers. So it's a demand supply situation. So James, something that I've read and, and how accurate this is, is only as good as the article that I've read, mm -hmm. is that it's not as much a shortage of containers, although there is a shortage of containers, but it's also where they're located. They're not in the right place. And, and that, that is compounding some of the issues out there. So for example, there are a lot of containers that are empty sitting in the United States and they're not where they need to be, which is in China. Um, and so that, that has compounded part of the issue. I'm gonna assume that with the trade imbalance that's currently in place between China and the US, there are a lot of boats going back to China, completely empty, full of empty containers. And we're not Correct. offering much in return. You, you know, James, I think there's, too many boats sitting outside of Long Beach right now that can't get in there and get unloaded. So there's a lot of full containers sitting there that they can't mm -hmm. get. And then those empty containers getting back, I know that the folks that deliver the containers to our warehouse here, um, they usually send some uh, farm products back to China. And these steamship lines aren't even letting them load those containers with that product. They're having problems getting empty containers to ship back because these steamship lines are just calling these containers back as quickly as they can. Mm. It's, it's better for the steamship line to get an empty container and run it back than make another trip back to the United States. They can turn it more times, that container more times in a, in a several month period. And with the premium they're getting off of that, you know, they come out ahead. So, so talk to me about how, how did you see these surfaces start or these issues start to surface back back last last year. So when you say you started to see things happening, what, what was actually happening? You were putting in for uh, getting a container and the, the delays delays started kicking in or were there other more subtle measures in place? Well, for us, it was pretty, um, pretty obvious. We would order a container and didn't arrive and our forger would scramble to find a container. And so it took longer to get that container. Once it was loaded and, and delivered to the port, we started seeing ourselves get bumped. Um, either the ship wasn't there because of the um, reduction in shipping capacity. Yep. And then once, once the shipping capacity was coming back and demand was increasing, we were getting bumped for larger shippers. So we were, getting, we were getting caught on both sides of that equation. So it was very common for us to see a container bump three and four times before we could get it onto a ship. That was our experience. Chuck or Sanjay, did, did you have other early indicators that there was this problem happening? I think we were the same. It was the blank sailings where they just went sail that week because the demand wasn't there. And then when the demand did pick up, 
-hmm. they didn't print those steamship lines back in production right away. I think they wanted to keep those prices high. And then though, as everybody was going out of stock, including those big box stores, when everybody started placing big orders, they just didn't have enough boats or containers to handle all that volume. Now. And so I, yeah, I think this problem is going to last for a while yet. I've heard that it takes upwards of 20 years to build a new port in the United States. And, and I also heard that you know, we may need as many as three or four more big ports the size of Long Beach. Um, 20 years of starting today to build a port, when right now, as far as I can tell, there are no plans to build additional large ports on the West Coast or East Coast. I see this problem only getting bigger if demand for Asian-based products coming into the U.S., if that continues to grow, this is going to be part of the reality of getting products uh, brought in from another country. Um, I, I'm curious around, as, as you see, I mean, all three of you in some way were able to anticipate the problem. How do you solve this problem at a local seller level? I'm not, I'm not talking, you know, the federal government deciding to step in and do something, but for each of you, the scrambling around and being more nimble, how do you see yourself continuing to stay ahead of everybody else in order to be able to continue to source product from overseas? Well, Sunday, we're, wanna... increasing our, we're increasing our safety stock. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that, that takes capital and there's costs associated with that also, but the uh, costs of being out of stock are larger than having safety stock. So that's, that's the approach we're taking, but we have not been able to get caught up from this last holiday season to build those safety stocks. And so that's, but that's where we're, that's what we're focusing on is keeping more inventory in the country and booking orders mm -hmm. earlier and larger. So Sanjay, what, what are you, what are you thinking about doing at this point? I think a couple of things. One is looking at uh, different categories of products that are U.S. manufactured that do away with some of these shipping challenges. Um, the initial uh, feedback there hasn't been all that great, um, <clears throat> but we're, we're still going to pursue that. And then the other is looking at uh, smaller products that it's cost effective to ship even by air. So it's hard to make the shift in the short term, but yep. in the medium to long term, I think that would serve as well. I, 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 yes, Chuck. Our, our strategy, you know, we, we early on, we, we, saw, we, we thought we, this was going to happen. So we started ordering early. And then, you know, we have um, three PL warehouses across the country that we deal with also. Mm -hmm. And so we're doing things like um, not sending stuff to the West Coast ports. We're moving inventory all the way over to the East Coast ports. So we're not getting log jammed over in Long Beach or LA ports. Um, in some cases, we're bringing the container all the way to the East Coast. And then one of our, like our Midwest um, warehouse, we're shipping stuff by semi-trailer out to California. And it's a little bit more costly, but we're able to get a few more containers out of China or out of Asia by sending it to the East Coast as opposed to the West Coast. So using multiple ports and multiple warehouses has been good for us. And then, um, and then we try to position inventory with, um, with Amazon using their AGL service and some of these other places using their freight services. So we got you know, four or five different people working, working for us, trying to position inventory and move it to different warehouses. I, I think if, if somebody's in a, a strictly an Amazon seller and they're used to sending it right into Amazon, and I don't know if there's a trick where you can, instead of sending it to a West Coast fulfillment center, can you send it to an East Coast fulfillment center? You might get a better chance of getting that on a, on a steamship line. Have any of you heard about Amazon's ability to work through all these shipping delays? I mean, are they in a position that they're a big enough player that they can offset and make sure they remain at the front of the line with shipping capacity? They're not. You know, we use AGL and um, they, they're just like everybody else. They got the same issues. Yep. Uh, yep. So I don't, I don't think that's, but, but by having multiple alternatives, at least helps us a little bit. But um, yeah, I think they're. I think everybody's struggling with it. I know just last week, one of the major retailers, you know, said their stock 
their stocks are going to be hurt this first, second quarter. They're in stock stuff that's going to affect their sales. And, and I think if, if you're lucky enough to have inventory, you might have a really good, you know, March, April, and May again. So Chuck, Chuck and Sanjay, or sorry, Jerry and Sanjay, have either of you played with moving products into East Coast ports? We have not. Um, the Long Beach port has been convenient for a number of reasons for us. Um, so we have not explored shipping product to the East Coast, but we have used up to six different uh, freight forwarders this past year, up from one to two at the most. And that has helped us uh, to an extent it, and you know keeps them honest when they know that they're not the only game in town. Right. But it's a question of availability and who's able to get your containers uh, on a ship quickest and less chance of it getting low. And we shipped our uh, first container to Oakland in January because Oakland had space and we were able to um, um, get it onto a ship quicker than if we waited for Long Beach. We have not experimented with the East Coast. I do understand that the Seattle, um, Tacoma, where, where I'm located and just because we're local, they, they have capacity and they're, they're publishing that they have uh, capacity. Now, I have not explored yet um, what, the, what, if any, additional costs will exist with sending it to Seattle and then trying to get it from there to, to our 3 pl yep, warehouses. Yep. So. so challenge getting container space in China, a challenge getting the boat to arrive and actually be received into the U.S. West Coast port. I've heard that there's now this new challenge of products taking longer than usual just to clear customs. Have any of you experienced that in the last three, four weeks? We have. Um, and not only that, to add insult to injury, so to speak, we had a, we had a container pulled for inspection. So that just added another week. Um, but, you know, that's just, that just happens. You know, that's just a random, random pulling. But it, it is definitely, it's take, every, every step of the way is taking longer. It's taking longer to get the unloaded. It's taking longer to, um, to get onto a train because we will train everything to Kansas City. Mm -hmm. um, and, and everything's just taking longer. So it used to be, um, quote, the normal pre-COVID once the container was unloaded, we were um, we were basically four days from our inventory. Now we're at least two weeks and sometimes three. So, Chuck, anything to add to that? Yeah, you know, we we've always budgeted thirty days from the time it leaves the port to being in our warehouses, and and really, it's probably more like forty five now. You know, like like Jerry said, every step of the way has been, been delayed, and including the customs, and, you know including the ports being slow, including the rails being slower. And so it's everywhere. Yeah. So let's talk about if, if some of these issues are beyond your control, what kinds of things can you be doing around, for example, changing the countries where your products are manufactured or changing your shipping quantities? How, how do those types of options potentially help you to alleviate some of these challenges? And we talk about let's let's diversify out of China. You know, it sounds easier than than it actually is. You know, talk to me about the kinds of things you've explored around how to have better control of of your of your manufacturing capacities. We, for us, we're we're a smaller importer, and we have explored outside of um, outside of China. But what we found is we would have to send all of our components outside of China, and then the um, there weren't as many sailings and it takes longer. And so we were looking at instead of basically we used a similar um, metric as Chuck of about 30 days. I think we were at 35 days. Uh, mm -hmm. We were looking between 65 and 75 days coming out of um, a couple of the other countries. And we just found it was not cost effective. So yes. Um, yes. I go back to my earlier comment that being smaller, we're basically um, building our, we're building a larger safety stock and we're going to have to carry that here in the United States. So, um, I'm looking for somebody who's smarter than I am to uh, <laughs> to to resolve that one. So, so Sanjay, th thoughts around you know tackling different countries or uh, different shipping quantities to be able to circumvent some of these issues. So we have explored uh, Vietnam and India for our products, not had success. India, in terms of responsiveness and professionalism, leaves a lot to be desired, unfortunately, and Vietnam 
has very limited capacity. So most of which is already spoken for. Mm. So that's a challenge. Um, I do know um, there are some other uh, brands that have moved manufacturing out of India over to the US for their products. Uh, that may be the way to go. And that's where we are concentrating our efforts. Chuck, anything else you want to add? Yeah, you know, we source from 10 different countries and every country's having a problem right now. And we bring some stuff right out of Europe and you think they would, they're not Asia, but they got the same issues. Uh, you know, it's an extra couple of weeks and, you know, whether it's our freight forwarders asking us to, to book the, the containers four or six weeks in advance, it used to be we'd book it, you know, two, three weeks in advance. Um, the freight forwarders are saying book earlier. And now we even got our factories that are asking us to book eight weeks in advance because the factories, they must have, you know, they deal with a bunch of freight forwarders too. And they must have a feeling that if we can book earlier, there's a better chance of getting something because these factories are in tough positions because some of our factories got 25 containers of products sitting in their warehouse. They can't produce anymore because they have no place to print the product. Mm. And so, um, so I guess what we're doing is we're ordering early. Um, we're trying to book earlier. And like I mentioned, we're trying to use those other ports and warehouses. So what happens if consumer preferences change? I mean, we're extending this manufacturing process. And now if consumer preferences change, it sounds like there's not really going to be an opportunity to change the selection that you offer. Yeah, it's, it's painful. We had, um, we had a couple containers that were going into Amazon that was scheduled to arrive at the end of um, October for the holiday sh shopping season. Mm -hmm. and th th there's stuff you buy in the fourth quarter. Sure. They both got checked in December 24th. And that's not a consumer error, but that's just missing that whole season. Yeah. And thankfully it was only two containers and not 20. But I, I, I think that, um, you know, the, if, if, you, if you're into the seasonal business where it's a short season, like just Easter or just July 4th stuff, that's pretty risky right now because you can't afford to be four weeks late. Jerry or Sanjay, what, what are you doing to address potentially changing consumer preferences when it's taking longer and longer for you to get products in hand? Well, that's, that's the nature of my business. I'm in apparel and footwear. And so we, that, we live that daily regard, and it's, um, um, so, the, so we are deeper in our evergreen products and we have been lighter on our, what I would call our fashion products and, the, um, the brands that we work with that are not our own brands, they're, they're doing the same thing. So right now, um, right now everybody's trying to figure that out and that's, that's the nature of retail. Sanjay, you're in a very seasonal business. How do you tackle this issue if consumer preferences change and all of a sudden what you thought was going to be hot for Q4, maybe it is hot, but you can't get more inventory, or maybe it's no longer going to be hot, but you're stuck with lots of product. We end up dealing with that pretty much every year. So there's some products. <laughs> yeah. You know, not the fun part. Um, fun part is when you sell through what you projected and uh, run out. But what we have done to offset that is introduce other products that are seasonal, but for other parts of the year. So mm. we've got that starts off from Easter, summer, um, and then Halloween. So that, that definitely helps, but then the delays don't. So mm -hmm. just making sure you're getting your orders in way in advance. So one of our big summer product line um, we ordered in uh, October of last year for this season, just knowing that it, you know, we ran out like five times during the season and uh, it did way better than we expected. And that's yes. the reason we yes. never with the demand. And so we are ahead of that curve. But as far as innovation in that particular category, launching new products, we've accepted that we're going to miss this season. We'll just use this season as just sort of a test and uh, do some initial launch. And then the real volume will be next season. So what happens when COVID has mostly passed and we're back to whatever the new normal looks like? You know, where, where do all these changes in, the, in shipping demands, where does this take us? 
Uh, we're not going to have the same PPE product demand, I would expect, filling up these containers, containers on boats. But you know, consumers will want to get back to buying things that they typically buy uh, pre-COVID. I'd, I'd like each of your thoughts in terms of what, where, do, where do we go here with this new normal over the next five to 10 years post-COVID? Yeah, you know, we're, we're struggling trying to figure out when at least consumers make that switch. You know, right now, everybody's buying products to spend their money. And when this whole COVID thing clears up and people go back to buying experiences, whether they're going to concerts or ball games or cruises, yep. you know, when's that money going to switch? And how's that going to affect us? You know, um, I don't know that right answer, but you would like to think that whenever that happens, that would actually help the supply chain a little bit because somebody's spending money on going to the concert or a cruise are not buying all these products for their home. Yeah. And um, so I think in the short term, that'll help us. Um, long term for, for, for our situation, you know, I feel like, um, you know, the consumer demand, more people going online, you know, brick and mortars, maybe closing more that the e-commerce world is probably a good place to be going the next five or 10 years. And, Maybe the supply chain will help a little bit because you mentioned it, the PPE. They spend a lot of a lot of containers with that. Yeah, that goes away, and they and they get back to normal. I, I think the future is good. Um, so we'll see. Jerry, your thoughts? Well, I go I go back to a newsletter I was reading um, called a Global Port Tracker, um, and they were they were speaking about that e-commerce and the new normal is going at it. The consumer moving to e-commerce and that that we've pulled forward such demand and growth and we have such growth in the e-commerce field that they think that they're believing that we're going to see a continued increase of um and 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 flattening of the demand curve meaning that seasonality is going to disappear somewhat so when you look at the um the seasonality of the products we have you know there's there's some highs and there's some lows and peaks throughout the year and they're seeing that flatten. And so they're, they're projecting that we're going to see an ongoing increase in, in demand of imported products, which is going to continue to put pressure on, on the supply chain and, or the, not necessarily the supply chain, but the, um, the infrastructure, the, the ports and the rails and the trucks. Um, so I, I logically, I agree with what Chuck, what Chuck is saying. Um, but then I read these newsletters, which they're, that they're thinking that we're going to continue to see this increase of um, people buying stuff because their habits have changed. I don't, I just don't, I don't know. So, Sanjay, what, what's your take on where we're going here with these new shipping issues going forward? So while COVID has definitely accelerated the growth of e-commerce, I don't think there's any turning back. There could be a temporary uh, pull back some short-term loss of volume as other sectors open up and uh -huh. consumers are spending more on experiences. But the demand is going to be strong longer term. That's what I feel. There's a new challenge right now, which I don't think too many people are talking about, and that's the rising cost of raw materials. How that's going to impact um, prices and how much of that can get um, passed on to the customer versus being absorbed by brands, that's to be seen. The uh, increases are pretty significant. We're talking uh, mid double digit, you know, anything from 15 to 60 percent, depending on the material. So. so you've already paid the China tariffs. You're now dealing with higher shipping costs. Now you're dealing with higher sourcing pro costs. It certainly makes the long-term appeal of getting products manufactured overseas, every one of these reduces the opportunity for margin. How do you see all of this playing out with this, the private label seller community on Amazon that has basically existed in part to be able to leverage sourcing from overseas? Do you see that slowing down very much? You know, James, I think for the for the the new person that's going to come in, it might be more scarier because they're looking at sourcing a product that the math just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my cost is higher. My shipping cost is higher. Um, and, and a lot of times it just takes 
a three or a six month wait for the market to adjust their prices. I might be sitting on a million dollars of inventory at an old cost that I can hold out a little bit longer. Yep. And so maybe a new buyer doesn't understand that. And they'll just say the economics don't work out, but um, I'm sure people like us, you know, we, we get that and we just keep plowing forward. And unfortunately you, you gotta, you gotta raise your prices and you gotta hold some margins and you gotta hope the market moves up, comes up with you and moves with you. And um, I, I've seen that in our category over the last year, you know, some price adjustments. And I, I even got some factories over in Asia that compete directly with me. And um, I had a couple I was talking to in the last month that, you know, they're saying they got to raise their prices. She, he goes, we're going to be at the price level you're at now. And, you know, they've always sold it cheaper because they could, or they mm -hmm. elected to. So they're finally raising their prices. Um, so it's probably not a great thing for a consumer, but for, for a seller, it's probably um, something that's going to have to happen. Jerry or Sanjay? There's likely to be uh, some churn. There's the, the larger or the stronger brands will uh, weather the storm versus some of the less established players that aren't as strong financially. Jerry, anything to add to that? I don't have anything to add. I think they're both right on. It's, um, yeah. So let me ask you this, uh, out of this situation, where is there opportunity for each of you to take advantage of these shipping issues? How can you make your business stronger today? How can you compete more effectively on Amazon as a result? Jerry, you wanna, you wanna start with that one for us? Um, sure. And I, and I go back to my ability to increase my uh, safety stock levels and I've been, and my relationships with the factories where we've been able to maintain some um, cost pricing, even though they're seeing material, um, in material price increases. So we've been able to maintain um, our pricing partly because we're also agreed to um, create some larger orders to help, yes. to help them. Yep. And we've uh, we worked closer with them to create longer term projections for what we're going to need so they could be going backwards into their supply chain to, to uh, try to take advantage of some of their, um, save some on their material costs. Uh, all those will, will help. And um, I, I think that's where, that's where our strength is going to be because we continue to be in stock where we're seeing other people that we're work, that we're competing against. They just don't have the inventory. They don't have the wherewithal to, um, to, to stay in stock and keep a safety stock. Um, so once we get through the, um, the challenges of getting the product here, I think we'll be okay. Um, and that's been our pretty straightforward approach to this. So. So, Sanjay, how do you take advantage of all these shipping issues for a business like yours that's so seasonal? Yeah, uh, it's a bit more challenging because of the seasonality, but uh, I mean, we do have enough historic data to know which products sell during which time of the year. Um, given that we were very well positioned last year because of having more inventory than we had planned coming into Q1 and Q2, that benefited us. But this year by design, we have uh, done that. So we are just holding more stock. Uh, again, it paid off because pre-Chinese New Year, only about half the containers shipped of whatever we had planned. So yeah, yeah. we're not going to have stock outs. Yes, there is a higher holding cost. There's more working capital that's locked up in inventory, but at least you're not running into stock outs. And so earlier, you know, it was a 90-day um, plan that we had in terms of 90-day lead time is what we would account for from yep. everything in order till it was delivered here. Now it's looking more like 150 days. Mm -hmm. and. It's not great, but um, just making sure that you're prepared for that and not going to run out um, definitely helps. Chuck, how are you handling all of this and turning this into an opportunity for yourself? Like those guys, we, we're seeing that um, we anticipated in July and started bringing in inventory in early, and there's things selling here in January and February at a much higher rate than we expected, mainly because the competitors don't have the product there. 
Yep. So we've been able to turn around and and think that you know we our next containers that are arriving in March and April would have lasted us several months. Now we're finding out it'll probably sell out pretty quick. So we're actually you know doubling down and ordering some more containers, and hopefully they'll get out. Um, so in, in the short term, it's going to help us. And I think if we go another month with very few containers, we would be we would be in trouble. But you know we got a, quite a few containers on the water right now, and and a lot coming in April and May too. So yeah. It's just taking advantage of the opportunity, and um, and hopefully, you know, a lot of our, a lot of my competitors are are China companies, and um, you know, um, they're, they're they pinch a lot of pennies over there. So I'm hoping that they're you know they they're, they're just refuse to pay that extra freight cost, and or they can't, and then you know we can um, take advantage of that. So another advantage that comes to play here is is as long as if we're assuming we're staying in stock and our products are, they perform well, that's going to help us with the algorithm also against their competition. And right, so there's a right. long-term, there's a long-term play there that, um, that is attractive. So. so, so let me, let me wrap up our discussion. I want, I want to ask each of you about software or companies that you've used during these, these past 12 months that these companies being particularly useful in giving you visibility into the scope of the shipping problems that your products may have. Uh, what, what kinds of tools are you using? Where are you getting your information? How are you staying up to date uh, so that you can better manage the situation? Uh, as I mentioned, we have expanded the number of uh, service providers we use, and this is all along the supply chain. Yep. And so getting information from those relationships that we have formed, that's definitely been helpful to navigate the situation. So you just don't accept what one person tells you. Right. And you validations along the way. Right. From multiple sources. Jerry, so, and, and anything you're using, Jerry, at your end to, to help uh, give you better visibility? No, I don't have any software tools. I, I'm re I'm relying on my communication with the factory and my freight forwarders. I utilize, I utilize two forwarders, and we're, we're, they're they're very good at communicating, and we're, we're speaking all the time. And so they're they're keeping us informed of what's going on with um with them, and mm -hmm. we're telling them what's going on with ourselves. And so it's a very open two way conversation, and uh, and we're we're very much in partnership trying trying to figure out what will work best for both of us. Um, it allows them to plan their production. It allows us to um, plan our um, deliveries. So, And Chuck, what are you doing at your end to, to stay up to date on all these developments? Yeah, you know, I think I'm just like those guys. We, um, we don't have any special software tools that we use for that communication. And, um, you know, we have a couple of freight forwarders and then we, um, we use, like I said, AGL, Amazon Global Logistics, and we yeah. got some other major retailers we use there. Um, their container shipments too. And so um, we're, we're getting a consistent message from everybody. And that, that was reassuring early on when, when I found out everybody was having the same issues. I felt like, is it just us? No, it's everybody. Mm -hmm. And so um, just use, use more, you know, don't rely on one freight forward or one way of, of doing it. You're going to have to use multiple because maybe, you know, maybe Amazon does have a way to get some stuff out that, um, your freight forwarder doesn't that week. And so yep, we just yep. bump stuff around a little bit. Yep. Sanjay, Chuck, Jerry, I want to thank you all for joining us today on the Buy Box Experts podcast. And I want to wish you all good luck in getting your products into the U.S. shortly. Thanks and join us again shortly on the next Buy Box Experts podcast. And now to finish today's podcast, I'd like to share some final thoughts. For third-party sellers to be successful on Amazon, a critical lever will be soliciting feedback from customers. We at Buybox Experts are really big fans of the team at Ecom Engine and its tools that help Amazon sellers to simplify the process of messaging customers of Amazon orders. To learn more, go to ecomengine.com. And with that, I want to thank you for listening today, and I look forward to joining you next time on the Buybox Experts podcast. Thanks for listening to the Buybox Experts podcast. Be sure to click subscribe, check us out on the web, and we'll see you next time.